Hello, everyone. This is Jamie Mulkey with Cavi on Test Security. And we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. I wanted to let you know about uh, some of the happenings with Cavion that are going on. We've got some upcoming Cavion events. Our next webinar that's coming up will be June 19th, and it's called Protecting Your Test Using Copyright Law. Our guest speaker will be Ken Horton, who's an attorney, an intellectual property attorney. And we'll also have somebody from our Web Patrol team that will be speaking with them on this topic. For those of you that will be going to the National Conference on Student Assessment, uh, you'll see Dr. Freemer as well as some of our other Cavion colleagues there. Uh, John will be presenting on preventing, detecting, and investigating test security irregularities. And um, that is this is the National Council on Student Assessment of the CCSSO Conference that will be in National Harbor, Maryland. We'll be getting started in, in just a couple minutes, but um, just want to also let you know about some of the latest publications that you may be interested in. Why don't we go to our next slide. Uh, the Handbook of Test Security is now out. I don't know if any of you have seen it yet, but it's um, online either from Amazon or from Rutledge. And um, before the end of the session, as, as we close the session, we'll give you a discount code. Um, so that you can buy it at a discount. But it's a, a book well worth keeping on your shelf. It's um, a compilation from, from a number of different luminaries in the field and just some great insights and interesting ideas and best practices with test security. The other thing that will be coming out soon is the TILSA guidebook from the State Assessment Directors on, um, on data forensics. So, uh, we'll, we'll be announcing that, but, but look for that coming out soon. We're just about at the hour, but we want to wait just a, a few more minutes to make sure that we get as many people as possible before we start the session today. Um, you can also visit us online. There's a number of places. Let's, let's go to our next slide. Um, where Cavion is, um, we've got our blog that comes out weekly. Um, it's a great blog. A lot of a lot of insight there on some different uh, test security and test development um, topics. You can follow us on Twitter at, at Cavion. Um, we also have a, uh, a security page as well as a test security group on LinkedIn. And this is really a, a great place to contribute, um, to ask questions, and to connect with other like-minded test security professionals. We also are on Facebook, so you can friend us there. And we post a number of things on Facebook from time to time. We are uh, just uh, about one minute after the hour. We'll get started in just a minute. Um, please know that all your microphones have been muted, so you are in listening, listening only mode. If you do have questions, go ahead and um, pose them in the, the question box. And uh, I will be looking at those questions and fielding them and um, giving Larry those questions as we move along in this presentation today. So we'll get started in just a minute. Looks like we still have people joining us today. OK, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I know, notice some people are still coming in, but we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with, with our presentation today. Uh, our topic in the next in the Cavion webinar series is using decision theory to score accurate pass-fail decisions. And our guest presenter today, once again, is Dr. Larry Rudner. He is um, with the um, Graduate Management Admissions Council, Vice President and Chief Psychometrician for Research and Development. So I'd like to welcome Larry today. Um, Larry, I'll let you take it away. Why, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Uh, Cavion shared the registration list with me 
ahead of time. There's 174 people that had signed up. Those of you that are in Malaysia, China, good evening. Thank you for getting up early or staying up late. Uh, it's very, I'm very honored. I hope the presentation will live up to the abstract and the uh, title, which clearly was attracted to you all. Can I have the next slide? I'm going to do this presentation a little differently. I'm going to talk about what is decision theory and how it's applied and some examples. Then we'll get into the logic of it, some tools, and I'll very briefly talk about adaptive testing. Um, hopefully, after the examples or after the role of decision theory, you'll be really excited, and then you can go to other resources and play with it some more. Uh, in the tools section, I'll point to a good article to read, which I think is a good article, and then uh, some free tools that you can use to play with what we're doing. And hopefully by the end of my presentation, you'll fully understand the logic of it and the basic mathematics behind it. Uh, we're not going to get very complicated. We're going to use complicated terms like Bayesian analysis, but we'll be doing, at most, multiplication and division of decimals. Um, Bayesian analysis has this uh, aura of being really complicated, but it really isn't, and I'll explain, you'll soon see why. Can I have the next slide? So the goal of all of this is to make a classification of a test taker. We've got K groups, K can equal two, pass, fail, master, non-master. It could be multiple categories. Uh, the NAEP categories or the uh, grades, uh, our essay scoring scores one to six, a whole lot of categories like that. Uh, that's what we're here for, and so we have. I have a few questions. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to uh, manage those questions. Uh, but the first question is going to be: Are you involved in uh, decision theory questions? So, Jamie, you want to put the question up? Here's our yeah. Here's our first poll. So. Go ahead and um, click on the correct response, and uh, we'll watch the responses come in, and then we'll we'll close the the poll and show the results. Let's just leave it open a few more seconds. Let people respond. While we're waiting here, if someone had asked me, will the slides be available? Yes, they will. And we're also recording this session. So that recording will be made available and will be sent out to everybody who registered for the, um, for the webinar today. OK, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share it with everybody. So it looks like um, there are a fair number of people who are using, um, you know, doing classification. And um, in particular with multiple categories, and then a few percentage of you are, are not. So Larry, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close that poll. Whoops, don't do that. And let's go to our next question. This is, this is kind of a getting to know you, Larry, wanted to make sure we understood you know, who the audience was. So let me go to the next question, and that is, how familiar are you with item response theory? So you can go ahead and um, select, go ahead and vote on this one as well. We really uh, appreciate this. This is uh, also a way to just keep our audience engaged um, and, and hear from you a little bit. Okay, that looks pretty good. We'll go ahead and close the poll, and now we'll share the results again. So about um, between 37 and 38 you percent know, are very familiar, either very familiar with IRT and or somewhat familiar with the concepts of IRT. And there's a few of you, about 5 percent, that have never even heard of what IRT is. That will not Let's be a problem. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about IRT as, we, as I present this. OK. And then uh, our last question is just what is your primary job function? So if you can go ahead and um, vote on this one, please.
Okay, um, let's go ahead and close this and share the results. So we've got a lot of psychometricians in the audience. Oh, this group knows how to party. And, um, and, and, if, and about 35% who are managers um, and may not be psychometricians, um, and then about 21% who are both managers and psychometricians. And we've got a few teachers as well as some item writers in the audience. So, Larry, I'm going to go ahead and close that out and, and let you move forward. The usual approach to testing is we worry about the entire continuum. Uh, if we have the a scale might go from 200 to 800, such as the GMAT scale. You may want to have a scale of 1 to 100. And we're worried about putting people at each point on that continuum. This is the normal, the familiar normal curve, and I've just expressed the continuum in terms of standard deviation units on the bottom. The next slide. So once we've got everybody on this huge scale, the challenge in making a pass-fail decision or classifying people is where do you place the cut score? Place it somewhere, and typically those above the cut score, you deem masters and you pass. Those below it, you fail. Where do you exactly do you set that cut score? There is no truth. There's no absolutely right answer. There's no God-given answer. Gene Glass wrote about this in the late 1970s. Uh, there's a lot of judgment. You use the angle-up technique, uh, which is basically uh, a group consensus. And then once you look at that curve, all those people that are really close to that cut score, given the measurement error and other issues, some of those are going to be false positives and some of those are going to be false negatives. So we're going to think about it a little bit differently. And let's go to the next slide. We're going to be thinking of it in terms of what's the probability of this individual being a master? What's the probability of this individual not being a master? And for the most part, I'll be talking about dichotomous decisions, pass-fail type decisions. So we're no longer interested and we're no longer going to spend our time differentiating between the 90 and 90 second percentile because all we care is are they a master? Well, that frees up a whole lot of mathematics, a whole lot of items, and we have a much simpler model. So can I have the next slide? So in the past, you would think you got a certain score, it's above the pass score, you pass. What I'm asking you to think about today is think about in terms of what are you likely? You answer this like somebody who is a master, and therefore we'll, you passed. If we look at it at the item level, the next slide. This is a, called an item characteristic curve. Uh, what we have on the x-axis is ability level. It can be on any scale. And on the y-axis, the probability of a correct response. And you can see that people at the very low end in this question 123 have about a 20% chance of getting the question correct. Probably a multiple choice question with five options. And as ability level goes up, the likelihood of a correct response goes way up. Again, we've got a prediction at each point on this scale, not just the whole numbers, but two, three decimals, four decimals down. It's a continuous scale. Well, in order to get a good calibration of this, an item response theory requires a large number of examinees. People sometimes talk about 500 examinees as a minimum for the Roche model, 2,000 1000 examinees for a three-parameter model. In our testing program, we try to get 2,000 examinees um, for each ability level. So again, you can see that we've got this, this issue of large number of examinees. We also have this um, other problematic issue called uh, unit dimensionality. In order to calibrate with item response theory, all the questions must measure the exact same trait. Well, given two questions, they never really measure the exact same trait. Uh, unless you really broadly define that trait. So the trade-off is we try to have uh, tests that have the same balance of questions, whether it's an adaptive test or a fixed form test. 
Again, let's go to the new thinking. Next slide. Again, we're not interested in your probability across the entire continuum. We're going to look at the characteristic of the question. The probability of a master getting the question 123 correct is 80%. It also means the probability of a master getting it wrong is 20%. It's either a master will get it right or wrong. Likewise, the probability of a non-master getting it right is typically a lower value, although it doesn't need to be. Um, and again, in this case, we have the probability of a non-master getting it correct is 40%, which means the probability of a non-master getting it correct is 60%. Let's stop and think about it. If he gets this one question correct, masters are more likely to get the question correct. If he gets it wrong, non-masters have a probability of 60% of getting it wrong, are more likely to get it wrong than a master who would have a 20% chance of getting it wrong. So we're going to extend this whole thinking out to a whole test. And today we'll be working with a three-item test. It's very complicated. and uh, I'll be presenting the data for that. Notice, uh, if we're setting a standard, we're calibrating our questions here based on previous masters and previous non-masters. And in response theory, you need a measure of uh, ability across the entire continuum. And sometimes we just go through a best fit procedure. Now, the nice thing about this whole model is if we go to, we don't no longer need this laborious process of setting standards, bringing people in, you have masters and you have non-masters. We're going to calibrate the questions based on those. So let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> Hopefully I've got you intrigued. Uh, clearly, I've introduced a simple framework. Some key advantages are we don't need as many items. Item response theory, you need a large number of questions to get a good estimate across that entire continuum. If you're using classical measurement theory, you still need a large number of questions to be reliable and to differentiate the 90 from the 92nd percentile. We're not dealing with that anymore. You can calibrate in relatively small samples as long as they're representative. And I'll be showing you that uh, it works as well as IRT when, you're trying, when your goal is to classify. And um, I'll show you that it'll also work for adaptive testing. Next slide. Intelligent tutoring systems are using the methodology. Uh, sometimes they call it Bayesian nets. Uh, diagnostic testing, I'll show you how we're doing that with the GMAT. Uh, talk about personality assessment. Uh, in the early 2000s, I developed an automated essay scoring system that, ranked, that looked at the essays, looked at each question, and basically said, the likelihood of you getting using these words is like some is highest for somebody in the six gets a score of six as opposed to a score of four. It can easily be applied to automated essay scoring. The more sophisticated methods today use something very similar. Clearly, it's a uh, natural for certification exams and in the course examinations. One thing I didn't put on the slide is situational judgment tests. And again, looking at the registration list, I think there's several of you that are involved in situational judgment tests. The key advantage for situational judgment tests is we don't have the unidimensionality assumption. So you could use a variety of questions, and did the person respond to these questions like somebody who is a master or a non-master or somebody that should go this way versus that way? So next slide. I'll present some samples. Again, okay, this is GMAT focused. This is a diagnostic test for the GMAT. Uh, what we did is we took the scoring continuum and we broke it up into four categories. Below average is below the 40th percentile. Average is the 40 to 60th. Above average is 60 to 80. And excellent is 80th percentile and above. And we looked at each of the questions on the GMAT. This is the quant section. And looked at the various item types. We've got each question is either a data sufficiency or problem solving, it's either algebra or arithmetic operations, and it's either real or applied. So each question gets to count three times in this analysis. 
in your response to all the questions that have this person's response to all the questions that involve problem solving are like somebody who is in the excellent category, like somebody who scored at the 80th percentile and above. Where do I want to put my energies? In some data sufficiency. Likewise, the likelihood of somebody who scored in the 80th percentile and above getting a response pattern like yours on the arithmetic operations question is 83%. Again, that's the highest category. Um, you don't look as well in the other ones. Next slide, please. The Berkman uh, method is a, a personality assessment that's administered to 2.5 million people around the world it's in multiple languages. Uh, three or four years ago, they converted the methodology over to using decision theory. Basically, what they do is they present a variety of questions, and they're scored based on people who people who are happy or not happy in different job functions. So in this case, your answers to numerical questions are quite similar to people who are happy doing numerical type jobs. And in this person, who happens to be my son, uh, his, his scores are less similar to people who are happy in clerical type positions. Again, these questions, we don't have the local independence assumption, so this could be a hodgepodge of mixed questions. Um, and again, how are you responding? Are you like one group or another group? Next slide. This is a certification examination program. I was asked to look at ways of reducing test length. And we looked at it using item response theory, measurement decision theory, short, was based calibrations based on a random sample of 100 people. And MDT full was calibrations based on, I think, 1,000 people. And again, this is a pass-fail test. It was originally approximately 250 questions long. And as we started reducing the test length, picking the best questions and scoring, either using item response theory or score, sorry, picking the best questions using item response theory and scoring using item response theory, or we picked the best questions based on decision theory and scored based on decision theory. And clearly, you can see that after a certain length, uh, item response theory fell apart. Uh, this test did not have a large collection of high quality questions required for item response theory, so it was misclassifying people quite a bit. Uh, the, the criteria here was agreement with the original classification with a full length test. The next one. Hey, Larry, this is Jamie. Um, we had a question from the audience, and um, Tia wanted to know, is decision theory similar to utility theory? Um, I've seen the term utility theory used multiple ways, um, but I suspect the answer is yes. Um, when I think of utility theory, I think of Brogdon in 1948, and uh, he's looking at um, the ratio of successes to failures, which is clearly a, a variant of this. So if that's what you mean by utility theory, uh, it's not the exact same thing, but it's a variant. Thank you for the question. And please, feel free to ask questions. Um, it makes the re presentation more in line with what you're interested in as opposed to what I'm interested in. So this last example was a state NAEP. We had four categories. And we, again, varied, played with different test lanes using item response theory and decision theory. Um, and you can see that at every test length, uh, decision theory outperformed item response theory, even though this whole test was developed using item response theory and the scoring was optimized for item response. Next slide. Now we're going to get into the logic and the mathematics. Promise. Don't be afraid. Next slide. A little bit of notation. Uh, K is the number of mastery states. We're going to be dealing with two mastery states, so K equals 2. P M sub K is the probability of a randomly drawn examinee being either a master or a non-master. 
So we'll have PM sub K1, K equals 1, to PM sub 2, master or non-master. Bold Z is the individual's response vector. In this case, we're going to deal with ones and zeros, um, and it's the whole vector of rights and wrongs. Next slide, please. So what we want is the probability of being a master or a non-master given this response pattern. And there's, again, it's the response pattern of ones and zeros. So the top of the page, we have the, the general notation. Again, k equals 2. So we're going to compute two probabilities, the probability of being a master given the response pattern, and the probability of being a non-master given the response pattern. Slide, please. Do you recognize these people? The guy on the left is Reverend Thomas Bayes. He was a Presbyterian minister who dabbled in mathematics. Um, he really was a mathematician. After his death, somebody found one of his manuscripts and published it, and that became the famous Bayes theorem, which you're all going to be experts in on the next slide. The guy on the left, no, no, not yet, not yet. Back up one. The guy on the left is Abraham Wald. Uh, he was born in Romania in, uh, in, the, in the early 1900s, uh, escaped Romania, escaped the Nazis, came to the United States, applied Bayesian statistics and the basic methodology we're going to be using for the United States Army to figure out how to point its artillery. It was a federal secret, U.S. government state secret, uh, that was released in the early 1950s. And this whole methodology is based on his approach to sequential probability ratio testing. Next slide. Top formula is the traditional Bayes formula. Probability of A given B times the probability B, and so on. Our application here, the probability of being a master or a non-master, given the response vector, is the probability of M sub K given Z times the probability of the response pattern equals a normalizing constant, we'll talk about that, times the probability of the, of the response pattern for masters times the probability of being a master or a non-master. Now, let's go back to the very beginning that PZ, PZ, the probability of this response pattern. Well, if a person made the response pattern, you have a response pattern, and the probability is 1. So that drops out of the equation. The N1, which is called the prior, probably an M sub K, it's in the population how many people are masters or non-masters. Well, if you've been running your program for a while, you can incorporate this value. Um, but you may not want to. You can set your priors to be uniform or equal, and then that will drop out of the equation. So our real equation, the next slide is, On the top, we don't have we no longer have the probability of the response pattern. I'm leaving the prior, the number on the far right, into the equation. Um, so let's look in the middle. Probability of a response pattern for a masters, or probability of this response pattern for non-masters. Well, that is the probability for a three-item test of one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero and so on, for a three-item test, that's eight different probabilities. For a 20-item quiz, we're up to over a million probabilities. Well, we're not going to have enough data to compute all those probabilities. There's too many possible vectors. But we can invoke a very common assumption made in uh, item response theory and, and traditional measurement theory, and that is, next slide, Simplifying assumption that the probability of 111 given masters, 110 given masters, is the product of each of the individual item probabilities conditioned on being a master or a non-master. It's called the naive Bayes assumption. In the mathematics world, it's called the local independence assumption in the IRT and classical testing theory world. 
not a complicated formula, but that's the one we're going to be applying. So next slide. We need to have our prior data. That is, we've got a three-item test. We've administered in the past, so we've calibrated these. And so look at item one. The probability of a master getting this item correct is 0.8. The probability of a non-master getting this item correct is 0.3. Likewise, the probability of a master getting it wrong would be 0.2. The probability of a non-master getting it wrong would be 0.7. So clearly, this is a really good item. It differentiates masters from non-masters really well. Uh, masters, if he gets it right, they're very likely it was a master. If they get it wrong, very likely a non-master. Items two and three are comparable. Uh, masters tend to get it right, and non-masters tend to get it wrong but doesn't do as good of a job as differentiating. Uh, if you're thinking in terms of IRT, question item one has a good A parameter. If you're thinking in terms of classical testing theory, item one has a good biserial or point by serial correlation. We'll be using a different statistic later. So let's suppose we have somebody who took this three item test, got the first item correct, second item correct, and the third item wrong. Just looking at it, first item, mostly right, mostly masters get it right. Item two, mostly masters get it right. Item three, you know, why did you get it wrong? Well, the probability is quite close. So just on a gut feel, looking at this, you can see that this guy's probably a master. Well, let's do the mathematics and do the numbers, which is the next slide. So the probability of this response vector for masters is 0.8, probability of getting it correct, times 0.8, the probability of getting item 2 correct, times 0.4, which is the probability of getting item 3 wrong for masters. We do the same for non-masters. Next slide. And we see the probability of that response pattern, 1, 1, 0, right, right, wrong. For non-masters, 0.3, because we didn't, non-masters don't usually get the item correct. Points times 0.6 times 0.5 equals 0.09. Just looking at this, we see the probability of this response pattern for masters is higher than the probability of a response pattern for non-masters. So therefore, you would classify this person as a master. But this 0.26 and 0.09, kind of hard to look at, especially when we start having 15, 20, 40 item, 100 item tests, because we have so many zeros that it'd be really hard to look at. So we, we normalize this, and that's the next slide. And that was that little c in the equation. If we have the next slide. What we do is we divide by the sum of those probabilities. So it's 0.26 divided by the sum, 0 0.74, 0 0.09 times divided by the sum is 0.26. So that, that normalizing constant for this question, or for this person and this question, uh, this set of questions, is 1 over 0.26 plus 0.09. And you can now see that those two numbers sum to 100. There's a 74% chance that given those three questions and that response pattern, this person is a master. 26% chance that he's non-master, so therefore we'll make him a master. Another example. Next slide, please. Hopefully you'll following this, because the, next, the slide after this, you're going to be doing the math. Um, it's the first item wrong, the second item wrong, third item correct, a master or a non-master. Again, uh, the likelihood of a master getting item one wrong is 1 minus 0.8 or 0.2. Getting item 2 wrong is 0.2. Getting item 3 right is 0.6. You multiply that out, you end up with 0.024. The likelihood of a non-master getting item 1 wrong is 0.7. You would expect the non-master to get this question wrong. Uh, item 2 is 0.4. And item 3, you got it correct, would be 0.5. And then we can normalize slide. And we see there's an 85% chance that this person is a non-master, and we would classify him as a non-master. 
Uh, next slide. Your turn. Uh, here's the data. Please compute as, well, as opposed to predict whether this person is a master or a non-master. Is item one correct? Back up, please. You're too quick. People need to see the data first. Trying to do that. I let me see if I can do that. Oh, shoot. That's it. It's the right slide. We're up. So may, you may want to write this data down in case Jamie gets trigger happy. Um, person got the question. First question right. Second question wrong. The third question correct. What's the probability this person's a master or a non-master? Actually, I'm asking you in the poll, is they a master or not? Would you classify them as a master or a non-master? I'm asking you to compute the, to compute the numbers. So let's give you a minute to do that, and then we'll put up the poll. I think I, I don't think we're going to be able to do it. Because um, I shared. You lost the poll? I shared, I lo I shared too quickly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we could try a show, a show of hands if you guys want to put your hands up. How many, how many people think that this, this person is a master? Let's see if I can. I'd say we've got about uh, 30 or 40 percent. 30 or 40% think that this is a uh, master. Uh-oh. Let's just look at the, the data. Item one, masters get it correct. Item two, it's kind of close. Item three, well, maybe it's not an uh-oh. Let's see the next slide. Got item one correct, so it's times it's 0.8. Got item two incorrect, so it's one minus 0.8 or 0.2. Got item three correct, so it's 0.6. Multiply that out, it's 0.096. For non-masters, it would be 0.3 times 0.4 times 0.5, which is 0.06. The likelihood of a master is greater than the likelihood of a non-master. We would classify this person as a master. Or if we normalize it, which is the bottom of the slide, 62% chance that a person's a master, 38% chance is a non-master. If we're doing adaptive testing, you'd probably want a longer test. Okay, so that's the end of the mathematics. Um, let's go on. I want to cover a few more points. Next slide, please. Again, the next one. There's three approaches to making the to going from these probabilities to making your your judgment as a master or a non-master. What we've been talking about is called the maximum likelihood. We've computed the likelihood of the response pattern for masters and non-masters. We once we've computed that likelihood, we say, all right, uh, the likelihood of a master is greater than the likelihood of a non-master. Therefore, we classify this person as a master. Next slide. If we had included prior probability, if in the past 70% of the test takers were masters and 30% were the non-masters, we can include that prior probability. So if there's a prior, we now have we multiply the likelihood by the priors and then normalize. And we have we have the decision rules called the maximum a posteriori probability. Uh, if you have a large number of questions and the priors are fairly close to each other, the prior wouldn't count much at all. In our diagnostic test, we computed the probabilities based on um, the percentage of people that's in the 80th percentile and 60th percentile. It doesn't mean the same percentage of people are going to be coming to the diagnostic test. 
So therefore, we're using uniform priors. We're not making any. We're not encouraging the data in any direction whatsoever. So there's a bit of debate whether you use priors or not. I tend not to like to use priors, especially when you're making, you know, computing things about individuals. If you're computing summary statistics for a group, then yeah, you want to be sure the group average is more like what you expect or what, more like what it should be. If you're making decisions about individuals, you don't really want to push individuals' data in any direction. So you would not include a prior. Next slide, please. This is a decision criteria that uh, I find quite intriguing and quite applicable in a lot of situations. And here we can apply the cost. How bad is it if we pass somebody who is truly a non-master? That is, uh, they would be in cell C1. Made the decision to pass them even though the person is a non-master. Well, I don't want my air traffic controllers and brain surgeons getting certification if they're really not a master. I'd much rather, I would put a high cost to that. And you know what? If I have, if it's at the cost of false negatives, that is, I didn't pass somebody who should have passed, I'm not going to be so concerned. Well, you can add these cost factors, how serious is it being a false positive or a false negative, into the decision criteria and move the decision that way. You'll still have the same overall correct percent of classification, but all those people that you could think of as near a cut score, they would be shifted based upon uh, your, the risk that you define. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I have a variety of free tools for you to play with. They're all at that website edres.org slash MDT for measurement decision theory. And as you go to that site, you'll, you'll see the following tools. First, first, next link, please, next page. You know, pull up an article I wrote and published in Practical Assessment Research and Evaluation that explains all the mathematics behind this. Um, it goes into adaptive testing. It goes into uh, expectations, and the in-depth map is there for those that want it. Next slide. Uh, on that page, there'll be a link to uh, a Java applet. Here, you can pick your response patterns, right, right, wrong, whatever, for each of the three questions. You can move these sliders to change the probabilities. Again, we have the prior. You can make that uniform. And then we have the item probability. And when you, as you move the slider and then take your mouse off the slider, the, the decision rules on the right-hand side will shift. So you'll see the mathematics computed for you. And you'll see the, um, the bars move. And you'll see how it's affected. And here, not on the screen, but it'll also allow you to do the, uh, the cost structure if you want to play with that. And you can play with making an item have equal uh, probabilities of a correct response at different values. You can see what its effect is. The answer is zero. The item doesn't count if everybody, if there's an equal likelihood of masters and non-masters getting the question correct, it's not going to contribute much. Next slide. There's an Excel spreadsheet there. Uh, again, these examples, and you can do your computations, and it'll show it to you. There's also options for four and I think 10 questions uh, on other uh, worksheets within the Excel spreadsheet. Next slide. If you don't have data, we can make some up for you. Um, <clears throat> And this is, there's a free tool. Uh, there's a set of tools for data generation, calibration, and scoring. Um, here you specify how many records you want to records, how many test takers you want to generate, how many dichotomous pass fail type yes no type questions you want to uh, generate, and how many groups. This is set up for four groups. Uh, you may so that might be A B C D or low basic basic. 
cetera, or you can set it up for two groups for pass fail. The dichotomous is the scoring, right or wrong scoring, as opposed to a variant of a partial credit model. And you click go, and it'll then generate data that looks like the following slide. Next slide. So here is a person ID, what their true category is, because we're generating the data, we know it, and then what their response pattern looks like on the specified number of questions. You then feed this data in to calibrate the data. That's the next slide. You put in an input file, you put an output file of what you want for do it, you define where the data IDs are. In this case, we had the group ID in the first six, in the, the ID for whether it's a true master or a true, I'm sorry, true category, this is four groups. The true group in column six, and then all the dichotomous variables were in the other column. You click go, it'll generate data that looks like the next slide. So oh, for each question, we're calibrating at this point. So question one, um, people in the first group would have a 67% chance of getting the question correct. And then it would jump up to 90%, 96, and 97 for groups two, three, and four. Uh, question DA29, dichotomous question number 29, uh, does a better job of discriminating for group four probabilities are low for groups one, two, and three, and then they go up quite a bit for group four. I like questions like that. Um, but each of these questions have some, some contribution, at least the ones on the screen. So now you can take another set of data, feed in the calibration data, and see how it works. And that's the scoring program. We have the next slide. So you feed in the input file, the calibration file, and where you want to put the output. And some optional variable is the ID and the true group. That is, in this case, there were four groups. What's the one that we used to generate the data? That's optional, because you may not have it. But if you do have it, then we can compute some nice statistics about accuracy and things like that. If you don't have it, then you're just using it to score. And then where's the data? And it's in columns 8 through 37. You push go. And we see the next slide. And it gives, if the data is available, the true group, predicted group, um, the number of questions that they answered, and then the group probabilities. So you can see that there's a low probability for person one to be in group one. Uh, and four, group two had a much higher probability than the others, so therefore using maximum likelihood and not using the prior, uh, we would classify this person as predicted group two. If you go to the end and you compute your accuracy statistics if, if you're so interested. You'll notice that um, we don't have a very good prediction between group three and four for examinee six. For examinee six, you go across, Probability of being group three is 0.4. The probability of being group four is a little bit higher than that. So he's classified as group four, um, but you don't have great confidence. Whereas if you look at person eight, we're very confident that this person belongs in group one. What you can do, my screen just went away. What you can do is actually compute the probability of the highest group, and that gives you a form of reliability. How confident are we in the classification that we have made? Okay, can we have the next slide? Um, Larry, I've got a couple questions that relate back. Um, first one is, where would the probabilities in the two-by-two two table come from in reality? Um, you would either have a group that you've tested before. Uh, if you want to play with it from item response theory, you can actually convert from item response theory in a cut score. Uh, but clearly the preferred way is you've got historical data, uh, just like you would have for um, item response theory. And, and, and then the second, yeah, second question, what, what would be 
what method of standard setting is really the best fit for determining master versus non-master within the context of decision theory? The decision theory is the historical people. Who have you passed, who have you deemed masters in the past, who have you deemed failures in the past, and then you're basically going to be replicating that. You could play with um, doing multiple runs with the data, selecting the questions that um, have high scores versus low scores, because you know those that have high number correct scores, you're going to deem masters. Those with low number correct scores, you're going to deem non-masters. Get rid of all the people in the middle. Now you have your contrasting groups. So you're, you then can calibrate your, each item in terms of likely or clear masters versus clear non-masters. Yeah, I just want to briefly go over adaptive testing. Uh, this will be very brief. and just introduce one new concept. Can we have the next slide, please? Am I lost? I'm hearing beeping. OK. That's just, that's just my other phone. I'm going to mute now. <laughs> OK. Uh, the, the approach to sequential testing or adaptive testing is you pick an item that's going to give you the most information, you administer it, you score it, and then you use all the previous data to update your data. So in this case, we're updating the probability of being a master or a non-master. And uh, have we administered the set number of questions, or is there enough information here that we're clear no matter what we do, this guy's going to be a master. He's getting everything right and nothing wrong, so we might terminate. If we're not terminating, we go back and keep adapting. That's the general approach. Next slide. Approach for adaptive testing here, we credit to Claude Shannon. Um, again, another state secret. He developed information theory, which was the precursor to TCPIP we use on the internet. And his basic equation is the next slide. The sum of P log P, which is a measure of disorder, or better yet, it's a better of uniformity. Um, next slide, please. So if we have probability of a non-master and a master both equal to 0.5, and we apply that equation, you'll end up with an entropy measure of 1. If we have the probability of 0.2 and 0.8, and you apply the entropy measure of 0.7, you get 0.72. Our goal in adaptive testing is to pick the question it's most likely to give the more peaked answer. So we can compute entropy, also called KL logic, and others that are the psychometricians around will recognize, uh, Kubo Liber, and use that to identify which questions are the best, most informative questions. So we can apply that. And one example is on the next slide. This is, again, applied to NAEP, state NAEP data, four categories. Um, with relatively few questions, you don't classify many people. That's the blue line going upward. But those that you do classify, you're going to be quite accurate. And for adaptive testing, you can actually compute these curves and identify, make some judgments as to how many questions you want to administer um, and how accurate you're going to be. Next slide, quick recap. Simple framework, small number of items for calibration, small number of items for testing, which makes it very applicable for a lot of situations. Uh, the science comes from Bayes, which is uh, around 1750, before the U.S. American Revolution, uh, developed and widely used in engineering, information science, not well used in measurement theory, in measurement, because uh, I think we got a little sidetracked with item response theory and all the joyful mathematics behind it. Uh, but there are a handful of articles using this that you can find in the literature. A lot of it came out of uh, work on, uh, um, what do we call it? Um, well, the phrase slips in my mind at the moment. Anyway, in the next slide, please. I think you find it quite, quite interesting. 
uh, for certification programs, whether they're large or small, embedded in instructional systems, a handful of questions. You make a judgment as to which route you want the, uh, the student to go in. Uh, we're using it for test preparation. With that, I am done, and I'll turn it back to Jamie. Okay, great. We do have a couple of questions. Um, Jean wants to know, does this method allow for a single cut score for all candidates, or is it each candidate being scored independently? Both. Each, you have one cut score, which is defined by your calibration. And you fix those item calibrations, and then you're scoring people based on the item calibrations. So is this response pattern like people who are masters or like people that are non-masters? So it's the same standard for everybody. Okay, and I think you answered this, but I'll, but I'll ask it again. For credentialing exams prior to using decision theory application, does the test cluster still need to use ANGOF or, or similar to define um, master versus non-master and then apply um, MVP? I would say no. Um, again, what you can do is use number right scoring, and clearly the ones that have a very, very high scores, you're going to declare masters. So you call them masters. Those that have very low scores, those are your non-masters, and you calibrate in those two groups. So in a, in a form, this is not an angle-off procedure, but you, if you go through the traditional measurement uh, literature, you'll find contrasting groups. This is basically a variant of that as opposed to angle-off. Okay. Um, another comment was, um, it, it looks like maybe you're uh, your server appears to be down or overwhelmed, where maybe where that your the software that you mentioned the application was. So it was ERES dot org slash HTML. If it's down, I'll make sure it's kicked soon and up at least by tomorrow. Let me see if there's any other questions in here that we need to uh, try to answer. Now, EdRes is up. It'll, it'll redirect you to a, a different site, but edres.org slash mdt. There's a question on the local independence and the multiplying each of those questions and how critical is that. There's a large, large literature on uh, the a naive Bayes assumption. And basically that literature said that even if you grossly violate it, you still end up making the same decisions. The probabilities may be off. So rather than the likelihood of being a master being 0.8, it might give you a likelihood of 0.85 or 0.90, um, but you're going to end up with the same decision. So basically don't worry about um, multiplying each of the item probabilities as a replacement for the likelihood of the response pattern. Okay, great. Um, well, that is all we have time for today. Our session is going to be closing. Uh, we appreciate your participation today. And as I mentioned earlier in the call, we will be sending out uh, not only the slides for this presentation, but a link to the actual presentation. So if you have friends and colleagues that wanted to see this and didn't get a chance to, we will, we will be um, putting this out, putting the recording out. Um, again, just to mention about the Handbook of Test Security, if you look down to the bottom of the slide, um, there is a 20% discount code that you can use if you order the book through Rutledge. Um, so you can get that information and, and go ahead and order the book. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone for June's webinar, which will be on the 19th. Um, talking about um, intellectual property and web patrolling. Thank you so much for your attendance today, and we will see you next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.